Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all very much for being here. My name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, which is an American culture center based here in Amsterdam. I, um, normally what we do, this is the sort of thing we do. We, have, uh, we bring usually American speakers. And whether they are fiction... A brief introduction of uh, what we will see uh, in this presentation. Uh, are usually, uh, the topic can in some way fit under the very broad definition of entertainment. I don't know that tonight's topic quite um, fits that. But sometimes uh, there, a topic is newsworthy enough or important enough uh, that we just feel this is something we ought to do. It's right to do. Uh, and so we're here tonight. In addition, I'll note that um, Ben Skinner's plane was, I believe, the first one to arrive in the skip hall after the, uh, the cloud lifted. So we're very grateful for him to, for, uh, for making it. Uh, and, and on that note, I'll add also, we had an event scheduled last uh, Wednesday, no, last Friday, with Catherine Stockett, the, no the, uh, the author of the novel The Help, which was canceled because her plane was canceled. And uh, we are trying to reschedule that. We're hoping that June 2nd will be the date. So if anybody here had a ticket for that and still has it, uh, it'll be good then. Um, so uh, please come. Our moderator tonight is Gustav Bessems. He is a writer for De Pers, uh, for which he covers Dutch politics. He's written about integration. Uh, he formerly wrote for Trau. He was a member of the Dutch panel of Transatlantic Forum on Migration of the German Marshall Fund. He is also a former winner of the Golden Pen Prize for the most talented Dutch journalist under age 30. I would like to introduce you now to our moderator, Gustav Bessems. Good evening. Um, have you all switched off your phone? Because this would be the time uh, to check. Um, it isn't that often, uh, if ever, uh, that I read a book that is um, so hard to put down and at the same time so hard to keep reading. Um, so I read and put down and read and put down and read again. Um, and if anything, uh, I hope that after tonight, uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, you'll do the same and urge others to follow. Um, you see, book reviews are a terrible thing uh, because they have milked our language um, for all it has, uh, drained it, um, and turned um, anything you can say about a book into a terrible cliché without any real meaning. Um, an important book is um, such a cliché. Um, you know, how often doesn't it happen that someone tells us that something is an important book? Um, and uh, sometimes I think it's code for uh, badly written, uh, totally incoherent, uh, I didn't know what the hell it was about, but it seemed pretty highbrow, so let's just call it an important book. Um, I hope you believe me when I say I mean the opposite, um, when tonight we are actually going to discuss, I believe, an important book. Um, I was wondering today what slavery means in the Dutch context. First of all, something historical, I think. In the east of Amsterdam, there's a uh, national slavery monument and. Each year, um, the abolition of slavery is commemorated, pretty small scale, um, an embarrassing memory uh, from a colonial past. And, you know, as long as our school books pay enough attention to it and apologies are uttered often enough and with enough apparent uh, sincerity, um, no one really carries a lot of guilt about it or a heavy conscience. And slavery is a word that is used, figuratively speaking. Um, in an issue of the Limburgs Dagblad, a regional newspaper in the south of the Netherlands, um, one Gert Enning was quoted, regional secretary of the South East Holland Metal Union and owner of his own company. And Mr. Enning is worried about the fate of the independent entrepreneur without staff, or as we uh, call that in good Dutch, the ZZP'er. Um, ZZP payers, due to the crisis, uh, see their earnings crumble, um, and now some receive no more than 19 euros an hour um, for their labor. 
um, an amount, so Mr. Enning has to get off his chest, that borders on slavery. Um, but real slavery, you know, here in Holland today, sure, some people have it pretty rough, um, but calling it slavery might be a little bit hysterical. Um, I mean, some have used the word to describe certain practices in the otherwise perfectly respectable profession of prostitution, um, like our current acting mayor, Lodewijk Asher. But that's also often said an ideological thing, something political. Um, and of course, there are incidents. Um, but this is the country and certainly the city of tolerance. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to remind all, all of us where we are, uh, but maybe just a couple of examples of our culture of tolerance that Mr. Skinner might have missed in the international press. Um, we have an action group here called I Amsterdam. Um, they wrote a manifest against the vertrutting uh, of Amsterdam, uh, which is hard to translate. Uh, most literally, you would say from possession. Um, but, you know, uh, Amsterdam is becoming too boring, is basically what they're saying. And they point out that uh, we were once the center of the world. Um, Rembrandt became famous here, and philosophers like Descartes and Spinoza wrote important works here. And to reach those heights again, uh, not only, according to I Amsterdam, is it very important that we be allowed to drink our beers again standing up uh, on the sidewalk, uh, something that is severely under pressure currently. Um, but also, we must take care of uh, the Walle. Uh, you know, heritage, tourist attraction, the red light district. We're also in a city where just this January, uh, Janine van Pinksteren, the leader of the Green Left uh, here in the downtown area of Amsterdam, um, campaigned one morning uh, behind the window uh, in the red light district, uh, posing as a prostitute. And this was to demonstrate that a little sex, drugs, can roll, it's all part of big city life, um, nothing to be too squeamish about. And it didn't cost her this stunt, uh, on the contrary, she became the biggest party in downtown Amsterdam, um, seizing about 25% of the votes. Um, I'll stop there, you know, not to drown us in, in, in petty local politics. Uh, and also because otherwise you might think that Benjamin Skinner wrote a book about Holland or Amsterdam. Um, and he didn't. He takes us to Haiti and Sudan and Moldova and India, among other places. Um, I also don't mean to suggest he focuses exclusively on slavery in the sex trade, far from it, as I'm sure he'll make clear shortly. Um, but he does take the issue of slavery right to our doorstep. Um, as a journalist, I believe he met his first survivor of slavery in 2003 um, and hasn't let um, the subject go since. Um, and he will speak to us tonight um, for about... 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, afterwards, uh, I'll interview him for about the same time, and then uh, we'll be sure to give the floor to you for any questions or remarks that you might have. Um, I think that's all. Um, it's an honor for me to introduce to you now Mr. Benjamin Skinner. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christel. I um Let's see, I'm, I'm not Dutch, so I'm short. Um, uh, if, uh, if anybody's not hearing me or if, if I'm bursting your eardrums, just let me know. I've noticed the, uh, the acoustics in here are quite special. Um, I, I want to thank you all so much for coming out. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity, because I haven't had an opportunity yet, to, to thank a, a few people for, for bringing me here and for really making the extraordinary effort uh, to get me on that plane, uh, which uh, was was quite an ordeal. You know, I had to wrestle uh, families that had been waiting for five days in JFK, and um, and they were they were not very friendly. I'll tell you, uh, they <laughs> d defied the, the the stereotype that I had of the Dutch of being uh, quite passive and nice. Um, um, first of all, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Russell uh, and Kustel, for that uh, uh, wonderful introduction and for for hosting. Uh, and thanks to everybody at the John Adams Institute for, for um, putting this on and for, for uh, allowing me to foist my abolitionist ideas on all of you. Um, and I also very particularly want to thank uh, Kosi Publishing for taking on the book. 
and for, for doing it in, in such a manner that, uh, that it, it brings before a Dutch audience um, uh, such a critical discussion of, of slavery. Um, uh, uh, I, I think the, um, the understanding of slavery, as Kustau pointed out, can be a, a, very, a very contentious one, mired in these sepia-toned photographs of the past or, or stuck in, in metaphors, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But before I do, I, just, I also want to thank, uh, very brief, briefly, um, Francie Hugeven, wherever she is, um, back there, who, um, uh, my good friend, who, without whom I would not have uh, been able to uh, afford to do the research. I, I, I cr she had this um, Aero bed, you know, one of these inflatable mattresses that I, I, I slept on the whole time I was doing the research here. And even though it had a little hole in it, and by the morning I would be on the on the ground, <laughs> I was still very, very grateful. Um, so uh, thanks to to all of you for being such such wonderful hosts and for for welcoming me. Now, to the issue, uh, as I say. When we talk about uh, slavery, we, we tend to think about it either in the past, and in particular in, in my country, um, and uh, it particularly at my university. I'm right now at, the, at Harvard University in Cambridge, um, which is a small university of some uh, 4,000 students. Um, and it has a reputation of being very um, serious and very old. Um, and it tends to be very backward looking in, in terms of its history. And particularly on this issue of slavery, the slavery scholars there um, historically have really sort of felt that they own the term, um, that it is something that describes the African American experience and really doesn't apply to uh, very many, if any other contexts. Um, and we're just now beginning to have that discussion, and I'm working with some of the, the, these icons of, of African-American uh, scholarship to, to get them to expand their, their, their view of this. But breaking through to the popular consciousness, um, to breaking out beyond the academy and, and getting ordinary people who who don't focus on slavery naturally to understand what slavery really is 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 an entirely different uh, challenge. Um, I give I give a lot of talks and I travel a lot. Uh, last year, I uh, I flew 240,000 miles, uh, which I learned at the end of the year the distance to the moon is 238,000. So, so I've I've put in my uh, frequent flyer miles. Um, but uh, there was one, one uh, trip where I was flying, uh, I was giving a talk in Hong Kong, and I was giving a talk in New York City, and it was an overnight flight, and I absolutely needed to get some sleep, and I was very sleep-deprived, and I was in coach, and I had a very chatty seatmate. Um, and so she launched into a conversation with the typical opening gambit, you know, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a specialist in mass atrocities and modern-day slavery and child rape. <laughs> and, and that usually ends the conversation, and then I can get some sleep. Um, but in this particular instance, she said, well, uh, uh, slavery, you know, I, kn I know something about that. I was, uh, I'm a banker, and I have, uh, I have two mortgages in two different countries, and, um, and I have to work at least 80 hours every week in order just to, just to make those mortgage payments and, and uh, service my, my credit card debt. And I said, well, you know, what I'm talking about is a little different in the eyes of the people um, that, uh, that uh, uh, in theory, employ these slaves, uh, in fact, own these slaves. Uh, these people are disposable. Their slaves are disposable. And she said, well, this was right after the financial crisis. And she said, well, did you know anybody that worked for Lehman Brothers, the bank that was, uh, that was uh, uh, shut down and summarily fired all of its employees? And I said, oh, okay, well, this is, she's obviously got a sharp wit here and, um, and a keen, uh, keen mind, and this is going to be a longer conversation. Um, and I, I didn't get much sleep last, uh, that night, but um, hopefully I made a convert. And hopefully by the end of this, I may make uh, one or two more here. At the outset of this book, I knew that I had to define the term very rigorously and very clearly. 
Uh, because, as Kustau so well pointed out, it's not just people who use the term sloppily um, to, to describe undue hardship. If you look up in Merriam-Webster Dictionary, uh, by the way, the first definition of, of slavery is drudgery or toil. So it's already uh, in the lexicon as a metaphor. Um, but for millions of human beings in the world today, their reality is no metaphor. These people are forced to work, held through fraud, under threat of violence, for no pay beyond subsistence. These are people that cannot walk away from their work. And by that mere definition, that definition which derives from uh, a 1930 uh, International Labor Office definition, which was adopted by uh, Kevin Bales, the great uh, modern-day slavery scholar, um, by that mere definition, there are more slaves in the world today than at any point in human history. Uh, the total estimates begin with the International Labor Office estimate of 12.3 million, and they range as high as Kevin Bale's estimate of 27 million slaves in the world today. Uh, now, where are these slaves? Because uh, in, in, the, in the time of my ancestors, and my, my ancestors were, for the most part, uh, abolitionists, although, you know, I've been, I've been talking publicly for a year and a half now, and my mother's quietly been doing a family history, and she said, you know, not so fast, Ben. There are actually a couple of uh, distant cousins who own slaves. No, none of us are washed in the blood of the lamb, clearly. Um, but for the most part, my uh, ancestors, or at least the ones we choose to remember, um, were abolitionists, and they they stood up on soapboxes in in states like Connecticut and Massachusetts, and they they railed against the traffic in men body, and and they were Quakers, and they they organized the meeting houses as as way stations on the Underground Railroad, and in their time, you could go to certain states in the Republic, in what was then still the Republic, and you could witness slave sales in in broad daylight. And you could bid on human beings. And today, we assume that the, the abolitionist movements of the past, and I consider ourselves in the fourth abolitionist movement, the first one being uh, Wilberforce and Clarkson uh, ba- banishing, ba- abolishing the, the slave trade into, into Great Britain, the, the second one being the one that most Americans think of culminating in the American Civil War, the third one being the movement against King Leopold's uh, slave empire in the Congo. Now, uh, I consider this the outset of the, of the fourth major abolitionist movement. Um, but in the past, it was, um, we, we assumed that those first three movements really did the job. They, they, they resulted in over a dozen universal conventions banning slavery in the slave trade, over 300 uh, international treaties banning slavery in the slave trade. They, they, they made it axiomatic that today slavery is an abomination. Um, And yet today there are more slaves than at any point in human history. And so as we begin to understand, as we begin to roll back that number and and break it out, we we have to at least try to understand where the majority of these slaves are. And as, as Kustel mentioned, many of us think of, when we think of modern-day slavery, we think of the media images, and we think of movies like Taken. Um, we, think of, uh, we think of sex trafficking. Um, we think of uh, trafficking uh, in, in, for the purposes of forced prostitution. And in places like uh, the Netherlands and in places like my country in the United States, uh, the, the plurality... Um, the largest single portion of slaves are held in forced commercial sex. But if uh, if you take a look, if you were to plot slaves on a map, you'd have to put more pins in South Asia than any other region in the world, in India and Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka. And the majority of slaves in that part of the world are held in what the UN in its... um, in its deathless prose, uh, calls uh, collateralized hereditary debt bondage. Uh, 
generational debt bondage. This is one of these terms like ethnic cleansing, uh, which is a euphemism, like human trafficking for that matter, uh, which is a euphemism uh, which in no way describes the horror of, of what it is to be born into a debt that you are then obliged to work off doing menial labor. And if you try to leave that debt, you are beaten. You are fully owned, if not in law, then in fact. Um, and so as a, um, as a result of the fact that by any uh, credible global study, there are more slaves in debt bondage, I spent a, a great deal of time for the book in, in northern India. And I got to know one slave in particular. And to give you a, an idea of what it's like to be in this collateralized hereditary debt bondage, uh, I, I wrote about a man whose name I changed because as far as I know, he's still in bondage and he's still very much in jeopardy. Uh, I called him Ganu for the purposes of the, of the book. And Ganu's slavery began three generations, uh, uh, two generations earlier when his grandfather took a debt of 62 cents to pay for the meager bride price of Ganu's mother. And two generations and two slave masters later, uh, that 62 cents had, had the, the principal had never been touched. It was, it was being charged at, at an exorbitant, the loan was being charged at an exorbitant interest rate. But all of that was beside the fact because Ganu was both illiterate, enumerate, didn't keep the books, and he knew that if he tried to walk away, the, the person who owned him, whose real name was Ramesh Garg, uh, would, would beat him, would find his family. And essentially what... Ganu and his entire family did was they were required to uh, using blasting explosives, using short fuse blasting explosives, which the um, the children would uh, would be employed to, to 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 pack and to light because they were smaller, they could fit into the tighter crawl spaces. The 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 families would in this village would remove slabs of rock from the earth, and then they would using pikes and mortars, everybody in the family would break those rocks down into gravel, uh, which was uh, and, and is today used as the subgrade for Indian roads. Uh, and if you travel anywhere in India today, slavery is never far below the surface. Um, and then beyond that, they would pulverize that gravel into sand, into, uh, in many cases, silica sand, which is an element in, in the manufacture of glass. And there's only one way in the modern world that you turn a profit off of handmade sand, and that's through slavery and through sheer brutality. And Ramesh Garg had become one of the most powerful men in this particular village, um, and in the surrounding area, by use of racketeering, by use of, of violence, and in particular by the use of, of sexual violence to coerce both men and women to to work in the quarry. And there was um, there was uh, a local uh, constabulary, uh, a police department, a police precinct. Uh, that I went in and talked to about Ramesh Garg. And, and they, they brought out this big old-school ledger, which looked like it dated back to the days of the Raj. And, um, and on that ledger, they had recorded um, very credible, uh, investigatable uh, allegations of murder four times over, murder of high-caste Brahmin Indians. And the police said, oh, yes, we believe that he committed these murders. Has he been brought in? Uh, to, to, to the dock has he faced justice absolutely not he's dangerous how are we going to go out and arrest him and uh, the local the, the villagers the slaves said they knew and they had witnessed this man kill uh, uh, summarily over a dozen slaves and in many cases children because they, they were not working hard enough they resisted work they tried to run away and yet this man had never been brought to justice. And at a certain point while I was visiting with Ganu, something, something remarkable happened. Um, Ramesh killed 
a, a fifth high caste Indian, a fifth uh, uh, Brahmin Indian. It was, a, it was a fellow contractor who was competing with him for a tax collection contract, which is a very lucrative type of contract because, you know, you say you collect from 40 people, you record collection from 40 people. In fact, you collect from 100, 100 and you keep the dif- difference. And so the competition over these over these tax collection contracts is very fierce. And, and in order to, to, to win the contract, Ramesh sim- simply killed his rival, which is what he was used to doing. The problem was the rival's family uh, pledged to kill him. And so he absconded. He wasn't afraid of justice from the, from the police. He was afraid of retaliation, of a vendetta killing. And I, at that point... The, the, the quarry was taken over by his overseer, was being administered by his overseer, who was a much more disorganized fellow, according to the slaves, who didn't rule with the same kind of iron fist, who, who wasn't as violent. And so this was in the, in, the, in the middle of the two months when I was with Ganu, and I said, well, this is your chance. Why don't you run? Why don't you leave? And his response, I think, is so revelatory about why slavery persists and why it, is, it, is, uh, it exists today in greater numbers than ever before. What he said was, how would, I, how would I live? How would I eat? First of all, Ramesh and his men would find me if I ran to Delhi to pull a rickshaw or, do, or did some other work. Second, this is all I've known. How would I feed my family? How would I feed myself? You know, while I was traveling back and forth between Indian cities on the train, I I was reading the the writings and the speeches of Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi had a a beautiful phrase about slavery and freedom. Uh, He said, freedom. He said, when a slave decides not to be a slave, the bond is snapped and the fetters fall. Slavery and freedom are mental constructs. But for, for Ganu... And for the slaves in that village, slavery and freedom were not mere mental constructs. They, slavery was their world, and Ramesh was God in that world. Certainly he was the taker of life, but he was also the giver of sustenance. And so when we think about how to finally eradicate and abolish modern-day slavery once and for all, we have to think about ending that relationship of dependence and allowing slaves to realize their own freedom. In my country, in the United States, we fought a civil war, and my great-great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather, I'm not quite that old, um, uh, fought with Grant's army at the siege of Petersburg, which was the, the battle which finally bled the Confederacy white at the end of the, near the end of the war. And... 350,000 of his Union soldiers died to enshrine the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. And yet, we dumped between 2 and 3 million slaves onto an economy with no access to credit, with no comprehensive rehabilitation, with, no, with scant rights short of the, the most, the most uh, uh, um, broad um, general rights in, in the nation as, as freedmen versus slaves. And so over the course of Reconstruction, over the course of the latter half of the 19th century, you saw the re-enslavement of, of Southern blacks through other means. And today, today in 2010, we are still paying the price in our country for that botched emancipation. And so as we think about development, as we think about uh, economic development, and as India thinks about economic development, and as we partner with India to think about economic development, we have to make sure that this time emancipation is done right. I want to say a brief word about, about the other forms of slavery because even though they may not be as, as, uh, as a big a category numerically as debt bondage, they are still... They are still monstrous. Uh, according to the U.S. State Department, there are between 600 and 800,000 that are trafficked across international borders each and every year. Trafficked meaning uh, taken, uh, transported, or 
uh, harbored, recruited, um, bought, sold uh, into slavery. Uh, the, the, the term traffic, as I say, is one more of these euphemisms for any aspect of the modern-day slave trade. Um, and again, a caveat about numbers. These are not people that stand in line, raise their hands, and wait for the census to be taken. Um, these are not people who, who register um, in any sort of comprehensive way. Um, and so when we're, when we're talking about the global figures, when we're talking about the, the numbers trafficked across international borders each and every year, um, these are estimates. These are estimates based on media reports, largely. It's, a, it's, it's rather frightening how often um, stuff that I do as a dumb journalist appears in, in, um, in, in boardrooms in, in the National Security and in, in, in meetings of the National Security Council, according to my friend who's on the National Security Council. Um, it shouldn't be that way. There should be much better numbers coming out of governments. And to its credit, the Dutch government actually has a very uh, diligent national rapporteur who could certainly do a lot more. But um, the fact that uh, she's been in place and she's been, um, uh, she and her predecessor have been uh, attempting to quantify trafficking in this country for, for several years now puts uh, the Dutch government ahead of most others in the world. Um, but the, the fundamental thing that we cannot forget, because, you know, unfortunately, you, you always have to, anytime you quote this guy, you have to qualify it. It's many times the worst people that have the best quotes. And Joseph Stalin was, um, was supposed to have said, uh, the death of a million men is a statistic. The death of one man is a tragedy. And uh, I didn't want to get lost in the statistics, and I knew I couldn't go out and patrol every border and, and see how many slaves were being trafficked across those borders. I knew that I couldn't go and do a comprehensive survey of every slave in the world. But what I could do is find one slave, one survivor, one trafficker, one abolitionist, and tell their lives in, in the complexity that, that the slaves revealed their own lives, the tragedy of their, of their lives, the hope of the survivors' lives, the, the venality, the motives of the, of the traffickers, and the mixed motives of the, of the abolitionists. And what I found was that, that slavery, real, real slavery, was, was terrifyingly close and terrifyingly real. Um, Let's say, for our purposes, that uh, we're in the center of the, of the moral universe. Or let's say that, maybe not Amsterdam, um, no offense, but um, let's, let's say the Hague. <laughs> um, the, let's say the Hague is the center of the moral universe. Um, the seat of the, the uh, International Criminal Court, this paragon of, of justice and virtue in the world. Uh, from that point, you are less than six hours from being able to negotiate in broad daylight the sale of a girl for outright slavery. And I was able to do this. Uh, in, in Bucharest, Romania, near the uh, main rail terminus, the Gare du Nord rail terminus, in an underground brothel, I was offered a, a young woman uh, explicitly for sale uh, this young woman had the visible effect of Down syndrome. She was brought out of a darkened room. On one of her arms, uh, she had several angry red slashes where I have to assume she was trying to escape daily rape the only way that she knew how. And what got to me most about her condition was that one of the traffickers had put makeup on her very quickly in an attempt to make a, a sale. And she was crying so hard that the makeup had run. She was terrified. And the asking price for this young woman was a trade, actually. It was a used car. That's what the trafficker wanted in exchange for this young woman. And I, as I did in every situation, I didn't pay for human life. I didn't want to give rise to a trade in human misery. I wanted to expose the trade as it existed, as it is ongoing, to the greatest extent of, uh, that I could. I wanted to seek truth and I wanted to tell it, but I also did not want to do any harm. 
What I did do in that instance is I went to the police, to the Romanian police, and I said, here's the wire, here's the evidence. And I was told, these are the Roma, these are the gypsies. They have their own language, they have their own way of operating, they have their own code. If we went in and, and brought that girl out, do you think she'd testify? First of all, she's, she's developmentally disabled. Second, given the fact that she's been raped regularly over the last God knows how long, do you think that, that psychologically she'd be prepared to stand up against her traffickers? And the sad reality is that this prosecutor was one of the better ones in Romania. This prosecutor, this police prosecutor that I was, that I was bringing this, this case to was one, of the, was one of the better ones who had successfully prosecuted cases. But she, she had discovered how difficult it was to build these cases and thus was very pessimistic about the, her ability to prosecute this case. When I say that I didn't pay for human life, I... I still, as would anybody, as would any of us, I think, in, this situa- in these situations, I still felt a responsibility. You can't drive by an accident, be the only one to see that accident, and not want to help the, the victims of that accident. And so in that case... I, I'm, I'm not satisfied about the outcome. I don't think that that, that young woman was, was, was aided by either my reporting or by the police. And, I, and I, she visits me when I think about, when I think about the, the issue. This summer, I was on assignment for Time magazine in uh, South Africa. And my focus was human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking in particular, around the World Cup stadiums. And I was uh, really bearing down and and getting to know Nigerian syndicates that had originally come to South Africa and set up shop selling crack. And uh, when they were there... Um, uh, when I was investigating them, they had they were still selling crack, but they were increasingly moving into a uh, a field which which bore a much lower chance of prosecution, which was human trafficking. And this was largely thanks to the fact that there is no comprehensive law in South Africa against human trafficking. This is even though the South African parliament, the South African authorities have known for several years that to adhere to international protocols, they must pass this law. Now, uh, less than than a month from, or a little bit over a month maybe from kickoff of one of the world's largest sporting events within their borders, they still haven't passed a law against human trafficking. And so the result of this is Sindiswa, Sindiswa was a uh, a 15-year-old girl who, at age 15, was sold into, uh, was recruited from her desperately poor township in in Eastern Cape to Bloemfontein, where she was sold to a Nigerian human trafficker who was operating around Free State Stadium, which uh, which is a rugby stadium but will be one of the World Cup stadiums. And... I interviewed her uh, within about four blocks of the, that World Cup stadium. And there was a rugby game going on that night, and you could hear the, the cheers in the background. And she was 17 years old when I was interviewing her. And I wasn't interviewing her in a, in a brothel. I wasn't interviewing her in the place where she had been held for over a year. I was interviewing her in a hospice. Um, and it was a freezing cold night, and uh, it was a state-run hospice, and nobody knew where she was. She'd been kicked out a week early, uh, earlier by her trafficker when she was too weak to stand up and serve as customers. She had full-blown AIDS. She had tuberculosis, and her stomach was distended, and... Uh, the next day, the nurses discovered that she was three months pregnant. And the, the three health phenomena had, 
had converged to make the metastasis of her disease that much more rapid. And at the end of a very halting conversation, I asked her what she would want three to four million readers of Time magazine to know about her her life. And she said, you know, I can't think in those terms, but I want to thank you for coming here and for caring about my story and for listening to my story because you're the first person that's ever done that. And she turned to a street pastor who works with the women on the streets, who brings them who brings them clothes, who brings them um, blankets, who brings them food, and who brings them uh, Bibles. And she recognized him, and she, she asked if he, if, she, if he would take care of her body because she didn't have anybody else in the world. And for a 17-year-old girl to have that awareness of her own mortality hits home with regard to what the end game is for slavery, for, for a human trafficking victim in South Africa, a country with a 25% HIV infection rate in the general population. And in fact, at the end of that, at the end of uh, that week, she passed away. The, the girl that she was sold with, her best friend, we later found that night, and it's a, it's a long story, and I want to keep this brief because I want to, I want to get to the discussion. Um, but my photographer was, was, shooting a, um, was shooting a hotel that had been taken over by the, the, by the syndicates, by the Nigerian syndicates. And on the fifth floor of the hotel, or on the, four, on the third floor was where the girls slept, in many cases four or five to a mattress. The fourth floor... Um, was largely uh, an illegal clinic, uh, an abortion clinic, where the girls, when they became pregnant, would uh, would be treated to to end the pre- end the pregnancy. And on the fifth floor was what was known as the breaking grounds, um, where the girls would be would be beaten, would be gang raped, and if they continued to to resist, in in two cases, they were defenestrated. They were thrown out of out of the windows. Um, and I interviewed one of the girls who was thrown out of a window, and she she had survived remarkably. And as my photographer was lining up a shot of this of this hotel, we had seen about twenty five to thirty uh, women that night, uh, women and girls working on the streets. But there was this one girl who was standing in red in the corner, and she just jumped out at me, and she jumped out in the viewfinder as my photographer showed me the shot. And I went over to her and I talked to her and I asked her three questions. How old are you? Fifteen. Where are you from? Eastern Cape. Do you need help? Yes, desperately. And she described how she tried to run away on three occasions, how her trafficker had used voodoo, she she believed, and the trafficker claimed, to, to pull her back and to, 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 to find her um, and to, to, to capture her and to bring her back with, with his enforcers. And it was a long story about how, how, we, um, how we got her out, and the, the shortened version is in time.com. It involved a fight, and um, I was at that point grateful that the pastor that we were with had, he'd been trained for over a decade as a, as a special forces operative in the South African special forces. Um, and um, and we got her out. And I was keenly aware, having at that point reported on slavery for, uh, and I, I actually began in 2001, and I often say that the first survivor I met was in 2003. Actually, that was the first survivor in the field. The first survivor that I uh, interviewed and did a comprehensive interview with was in 2002, and I'd begun working in 2001. And from the beginning, I had a keen sense of the challenges of recovery and rehabilitation. And in a situation like this, where I'd taken off my journalist hat and gotten involved and helped this girl get out, I knew that that wasn't the end of the story. And so I worked with a social worker, a government social worker, found a, a safe house, a shelter uh, uh, in, in this girl's home state, which was over nine hours away uh, by car, uh, a safe distance, we thought, and uh, 
I found a sponsor for the girl who sponsored uh, her school, and she is doing well. She is recovering. She's HIV negative, uh, and it would be a stretch to call her lucky, given what she's been through, but she has another chance at life. And so when we think about what we do about this and how we fight the trade, and hopefully we'll um, discuss that in a, in a minute, and I'm eager to involve all of you in, in, um, in sharing your thoughts and ideas, we have to think about her. And we have to think about, I call her Elizabeth. She's still alive, um, and uh, she's a victim of child rape, so I changed her name. Um, but we have to think about Elizabeth, and we have to think about the potential that she holds, not only to be a survivor, but to be an active citizen and to be a leader and an abolitionist. And I think about a young woman named Tatiana. Um, that was the name that she chose, who was trafficked into sexual slavery here in Amsterdam. And I write about her story in the book. And after she was freed in a police raid, she went right back at her traffickers and she testified against them in court. And she, uh, and she did more than that. She began organizing to free others. And she would slip into brothels um, and pass messages to potential victims in rolled in lipstick containers and stuck stickers on, on, on uh, brothel bathrooms um, saying, here's a number, here's help, here's a way to get out. Slaves can be survivors and they can be active citizens, as I say, and they can be leaders and they can be the leading abolitionists. It's, it's happened throughout history and, and this is why we can't think of these people as disposable. We have to think of them as potential, as unrealized potential. So I'll end with a, with a quote from one of my favorite abolitionists um, who, like me, I think was a bit of a, um, I don't want to say misanthrope, but he certainly liked his, he liked his quiet time, Henry David Thoreau. Um, who was torn between pacifism and abolitionism in the, in, the, in the days before the American Civil War. And two days before the, shots, the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, he'd written to a friend of his who was, uh, who'd been reading reports of slavery and the rumbling disunion in the New York Herald. And he, he wrote to this friend and he said, If you know of it, you're a particeps criminis. You're a partner in the crime. What business have you if you are an angel of light to be pondering over the deeds of darkness? And he meant that very much as an admonition, as, as a warning. I took it, and I hope all of you take it, as a call to arms, as a, as a call to get involved. And so hopefully in the discussion now we'll be able to talk about some of the, the ways to do that. So thank you so much. in little people's okay um, so you grew up in Wisconsin in Nigeria why, in, why Nigeria um, my, my father actually was uh, who's British was a colonial officer um, and developed a um, an affinity for the place I guess and uh, wound up um, as a professor of uh, African studies, African languages, and literature, and so he was there teaching in, in northern Nigeria, and I was, I was there getting getting lost and, and chasing lizards. Okay. And then, what age was that? <laughs> What's that? What, what age were you there, more? Than oh, I we we moved when I was two years old, so I was I was quite young, and I and I spent um, uh, my so some of my earliest earliest memories are, are from there. Yeah. Um, so when you grew up, did you have the same image of slavery that you described in the beginning of your talk? Uh, something of African-Americans in history? Or? I did. In, um, I, as I mentioned, I was a Quaker. Um, and as anybody who knows the history of the Quakers knows, um, the Quakers are very much at the forefront, uh, were very much at the forefront of 
of many of the progressive social movements over the last two centuries, including the suffrage, uh, the movement for women's suffrage, um, the anti-Vietnam War movement, um, today the gay rights movement, and um, uh, so many of them were the the leading abolitionists, and and the, the places of abolitionist thought were the were the Quaker was the Quaker meeting house, and so I grew up um, in first day school talking really much more about Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman than I did about Jesus and Moses. Uh, and, um, and I was very excited by that. And I was, um, I, I can, honestly, my, my knowledge of the Bible didn't really come in until much later, but my knowledge of, of the anti-slavery struggle, that was, that was in those formative years. So, so what was the moment when you got that this wasn't something only of the past, but something going on right now? Um, you know, it was partly picking up Kevin Bale's book, Disposable People, in 1999, um, and uh, that was what brought this to my attention. Um, and But, you know, Kevin was describing it um, in, in very uh, stark terms, and he, in, in his book he includes some description, um, but it wasn't, you know, there, there's nothing that you can read that supplants the experience of going um, to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, um, and in broad daylight negotiating with a man who's offering to sell you a 12-year-old girl for a domestic and explicitly for sexual slavery as well, um, uh, who's offering to sell you that girl outright for $50. Um, you know, that there's, there's nothing that you can read that, will, can, that can replace that experience. You mentioned the woman you call Tatiana in your yeah. in your book um, what, can you describe now why did you slam the table and oh. can you describe what happened well this was you know I, I, I tried to be as honest about my faults as a journalist um, with uh, when when writing this book as possible um, because uh, I think it can be instructive to others who want to work in this field. I think it's, there are important lessons that I learned, in many cases, the hard way. And one of the lessons that I learned was um, when you're interviewing survivors, let survivors let, set the rules. Um, the most important thing, the most important aspect, uh, the, the two principal um, rules of a journalist, as far as I'm concerned, are seek truth and tell it and do no harm. And when you're talking to survivors, I think very often what you see in the media is a, is a sort of a unintentional double victimization, um, secondary victimization of the, of the survivors where they, there is a, um, uh, in a, in a rush to get a salacious story and to see their misery, um, they are put in front of cameras, they are child rape victims are shown full face, Um, and they are humiliated, degraded, and it therefore hinders their ability to recover and, and lead a normal life. Um, with Tatiana, I, we, had a, we had a verbal agreement um, that I wouldn't uh, reveal her home country, and today I haven't, um, and that I would change her name to the name that she chose, and that I would change the name of her traffickers, and that I would uh, not put out any identifying characteristics of her of her family and it's one thing to say those things it's another thing for her who for very understandable reasons has a deep distrust particularly of men um so what to, happened well what what happened was we were going uh we were in romania together and it was her first time actually leaving the netherlands sh since she'd been trafficked here um And uh, she was helping me understand um, the dynamics of trafficking and helping me identify trafficking victims, the people that she said were, were trafficking victims. And, um, and essentially, this was my fault. I, I was, um, she, she was, she was doubting um, my sincerity. She felt that I would expose her at a certain point. She, she felt, felt that I would expose her family. And I, it was frustrating for me because no matter how many times I told her that I wouldn't, she wouldn't believe me. And, of course, I understood why. 
And so there was one point where we were arguing back and forth, and it was very hot, and I was actually just about to go undercover um, to, to go into a very... Um, a very tense situation with some people that I'd only just met who would be leading me into a, um, a to infiltrate a human trafficking network and um, in a, a part of Bucharest that I'd, where I'd never been. And I was tense, and at a certain point, because she was just, you know, she was angry, she was livid. Um, she was volcanica, as, the, as, the, um, as our Romanian uh, landlady said. Um, and at a certain point, I slammed the table to pause the invective. And her reaction in that point is something that I'll never forget. She sort of, you know, seized up, and there was this physical reaction as if I'd hit her. Um, and it was, a, it was a grave mistake on my part, and I, it didn't matter how many times I apologized. Um, uh, she was terrified. She was terrified. And um, the, by that afternoon, she was calm, and I said, listen, let's just put this in writing, which is something that we should have done from the beginning. And after I put it in writing, after I gave her what was essentially a legal document saying, I will not reveal um, your name, I will not reveal any characteristics of your family, I will not reveal your home country, and I will change the names of anybody that you tell me to change the names of, she was much more calm and we could, we could, we could proceed. Um, but she, it, was, it, was a, you know, it was a hard lesson, and it was, um, it was also revealing of the deep damage that comes of from this type of of bondage yeah. because she's one of the people you mentioned hey that you call survivors people mm. that manage to get out and, and build uh, a life for themselves yeah. whereas others um, uh, don't or aren't able to uh, did you get a sense of what makes because uh, because there's a few very impressive people in your mm. book what makes the survivors survivors you know uh, I think one very strong element of what makes survivors um, strong survivors is if there is some time in their life where they felt unconditional love. Um, and the most challenging cases that I saw were those that had been abandoned from birth, who had been slaves their entire lives, um, who'd never had that sense of unconditional love from a parent. Um, but uh, I, I write in the first chapter about a young man named Bill Nathan who uh, had a um, a very loving mother who, though poor, took care of him and his, um, him and his sister to the best extent, uh, to the best of her ability. Um, when she died when Bill was age uh, six, uh, Bill was taken in like hundreds of thousands of children. UNICEF estimates 225,000 before the quake you know, um, who knows how many now, um, uh, was taken in as a child slave, a child domestic slave. And the, um, uh, for three years, he was brutalized by the, the, the woman in that, in that house uh, who forced him to work, forced him to carry water, forced him to do errands, forced him to, to do all manner of uh, menial tasks and beat him savagely with electrical cords, with a cat of nine tails, when, when he didn't perform to task. He was eventually rescued uh, uh, with the help of an American nun uh, who literally um, hired a couple of men to come and grab him and uh, took him to a safe house. And then for, for the next few years, he recovered in an orphanage in Port-au-Prince. He wound up being the, um, the manager of this orphanage. And when I found him, he was this incredible man who... Uh, I was, he was 21 years old when I was interviewing him, and he had this calm and this grace and this presence of mind to deal with all manner of situations. And we went into Cite Soleil, which is the world's largest slum, largely controlled by gangs, and he was a guide there and kept his cool the whole time. And when I got malaria, when I contracted malaria, um, he kept me alive. And he, um, he found the, um, the chloroquine on the street that... that cured me of the of the disease and he fed me and he prayed for me um and um so in the earthquake just as a as a coda to this story in the earthquake um uh he was the first person i called just to check on his um on his uh well-being and i couldn't get through on the cell phone eventually within 12 hours i'd heard that he was very gravely injured and um he had been on the on the roof of his of the orphanage that he runs, and in the earthquake, the top three floors concertinaed, 
and the, the, the roof pitched him forward, and he fell down uh, eight stories and bounced off his back, um, shattered his vertebrae, and um, uh, the last thing he remembers is um, uh, so he said something. He said God told him to roll. He said roll, Bill, and he rolled over, and um, there he saw all of the all of the concrete and the rebars and the and the and the wind charger and all of the glass coming down on top of him. And he reached up and he 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 with his last ounce of strength he pulled himself up with a clothesline and then he collapsed. And um, so when I'd heard about this, um, and we were told, you know, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't being admitted to the hospitals. Of course, the hospitals were completely overwhelmed or destroyed. Um, he wasn't uh, being admitted even for basic uh, clinic care. Um, there was an American, 24-year-old volunteer American nurse who um, is my hero who, who kept him alive for three days. Um, but we needed to get him out. And um, uh, the, the head of the organization, who's this burly Texan, the head of the American Umbrella Organization that that uh, funds the orphanage um, said to me, you know, when your family's in trouble, you show up. Um, that's regardless of whether they've shut the, uh, uh, whether the American Marines are shutting the airport down or not, you find a way in. And so we, we chartered a plane. I made a lot of phone calls to my old friends in government. Uh, this is where it helps to work for people like Richard Holbrook and, and, and Samantha Power. And we got, we got special clearance to land. And, um, uh, 72 hours later, after the earthquake, we touched down. 19 hours later, we got him out, and um, he's uh, he walks with a limp today, but he's walking. Um, we get to know quite a few slaves and survivors uh, in your book. Do you feel you've also got into the head of the perpetrators, the mm. the woman who abused Bill, the mm. people who traded? Tachyana. I mean, you, you're, in, you're in touch with them, but they're obviously not too keen, um, you know, to give deep, deep psychological <laughs> insights. Um, yeah, you, you have know, you come to understand them? Yeah, I did, and I and I approached that crowd from a couple of different perspectives. Sometimes, in for example, in Haiti, with the trafficker on the street, because there was no law against, because there is no law against human trafficking, um, and the rest of X system, technically technically is legal even though slavery isn't um he was operating very openly in the street i told him i was a journalist i put the tape recorder down and i said you know can we talk about this and then i kept the tape recorder running and he was very explicit about um oh yeah this this girl will be able to do you know to cook to clean for you um do you need her to be able to cook any particular type of yeah, food but, and, but it takes something to think of someone else as yeah, your possession and, right and to give them a beating when you think they well, you remember, what you, is that? What you is remember that? in Uncle Tom's Cabin, the, the, the greatest novel of the, of the 19th century, um, the description of the slave trader and how he felt that he was doing a service. He was providing a service. He was, he was um, uh, helping supply meet demand. He was, um, he was serving his function within the market economy. Um, I, I, hear, I heard that a lot. I, in the case of this trafficker in Haiti, he felt that he was actually, you know, he, he sort of had this humanitarian shtick where he said, oh, well, yeah, this is, of course, you're, you're rich, you're white, and these are, these are, you know, poor Haitian kids, and, and um, therefore they must be better off if they're with you. Even though at a certain point he leaned in and totally blew his, blew his humanitarian shtick when he said, you know, this is rather a delicate question, but would you want this child as a partner? meaning a sexual partner, a uh, 12-year-old girl, mind you. And I said, would it be possible to have this child as a, as a partner? Um, and, and he said, we, oui, no problem, no problem, of course. Um, and so, um, and then in other instances, for example, in Romania, I went into Jilova prison, which is a maximum security prison uh, outside of Bucharest, and talked to traffickers who had made... Um, who had made one trafficker claimed to have made over a million dollars um, uh, trafficking women, luring, recruiting women from um, uh, Moldavia and other um, rural provinces in uh, in Romania, um, beating them up, forcing them into into uh, prostitution, uh, raping them, and um, and then selling them on to uh, a middleman, selling them into one trafficking network or another. And um, and when I when I said you know now that you've been arrested do you have any remorse for this he said 
and I, and I said, well, what are you, um, what are you planning on, on doing when you get out of here? And it was remarkable. He said, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing right now, which is earning money from, from trafficking, from, from doing this business. Um, and, and I said, well, what do, you, what do you mean you're earning money right now? And he said, well, I have women that are working for me that are sending me money here in prison. And I turned to the guard at this point. I said, how, you know, how is that possible? And the, and the guard said, well, you know, it's, they have to be able to buy things at the, at the, at the store in prison. <laughs> so, so, so let's move to the market a little bit. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think we're in one now. Sure. Um, how complicit uh, uh, are we here? Or, or let's take, for instance, um, men who uh, go to prostitutes here in Amsterdam that might have been... Traded, or how how big is their role? Well, first of all, as you said at the outset, I I draw a distinction between women that are working in prostitution of their own free, adult women that are working in prostitution yeah. of their own free will, and women that are trafficked into it, that are that are forced into it. But, uh, but I think most customers wouldn't make that check before uh, they exactly exactly. Yeah. And I think I think that therein lies the problem um, when when men assume. Um, that women are doing this because they're earning money for themselves or their families. Um, they're doing it for, uh, of their own free will. That's a very convenient assumption. But um, it, it, in many cases, even if a woman is, is, is at that point doing it of her own free will, in many cases, she would have been trafficked originally. Um, and so is it any more acceptable to, to pay for sex you know, after... Um, uh, a woman has has liberated herself if she was trafficked in in the beginning, you know. I I I think clearly there's no question that prostitution, in my mind, is always exploitative. It's often abusive. It's degrading. It's not like other forms of work. As much as as you know, people may try to to say it's like other forms of work and may try to try to unionize and and build it up to be like other forms of work. It's not like other forms of work. Um, and um, and so when we don't seek to help women get out of that situation um, and 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 transfer into um, uh, other forms of employment um, that are legitimate as well as being legal, and I draw a distinction between legitimate and legal with prostitution, um, then we are failing women in society. You, you we don't have it anymore now. Uh, the Tippel Zone at, mm. the, at the Thamesweg um, in the Harbour area, but. You visited it when it was here, and, and or studied. I, I, actually, I didn't. Um, oh. But 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 I described it to, with some detail after interviewing Tatiana, who was held okay. there. Okay, right, right. What, what what was your impression of the Dutch system? Mm. Um, you know, I, in in America, um, when I'm asked about the when I'm people try to draw me into the legalization versus criminalization debate. Um, I often say that I'm agnostic. Um, and um, the reason for that um, is in America, we're basically agnostic on the issue. You know, the, the, the general Dutch impression of American law is that, oh, prostitution is illegal there, prostitution is decriminalized here. Well, actually, that's not the case. There's no federal law against prostitution in America, there's there's a law that prohibits the transport of women across state lines for the purposes of prostitution, but that's different. Um, there's no federal law against consensual adult prostitution in America, and that's why in certain counties in Nevada, it's it can be decriminalized. Um, uh, that said, there is constant debate about this, and one of the ways in which the debate has been um, formed of, of late, I found very troubling, where there has been an attempt to hijack the trafficking discourse and the trafficking law, and there's a very good law against trafficking in the United States, which requires that prosecutors prove force, fraud, and coercion. Uh, force, fraud, or coercion in in the case of any type of uh, trafficking into any kind of service. Um, and there's been an attempt to remove that requirement in the case of prostitution, essentially passing the first ever federal law against consensual adult prostitution. I think that's a mistake. Uh, there are between 60 and 80 million prostitutes in the world today. Not all of them are slaves. Um, 
Uh, certainly, again, we can say that they're exploited. We should we should try to find alternative, um, legitimate alternatives for them to earn a living, to feed their families. Um, we should make sure that no woman, uh, for any reason, be it violent or economic, is is forced to forced to enter into prostitution. But um, but it's not always slavery. And and you know, I think one of the one of the most poignant ways that this was explained to me was. There's this huge, um, uh, physically big uh, prosecutor, tough guy prosecutor, um, who was one of the most decorated federal prosecutors in in the United States, um, who put away more than 100 traffickers over the course of some 15 years in the Justice Department. And I asked him about this. And he said, you know, part of what I have to do is train cops. And how do I go and explain to a cop that, the the victim what I explained to that cop what I l- learned in my women's studies class um, uh, in my feminist theory class which is that the the victimization of a woman who is working uh, 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 in Georgetown living in her own apartment um, making a hundred thousand dollars a year advertising in the city paper and not working for any pamp how do I explain to that cop that her victimization is exactly the same as any one of the victims that I helped get out of bondage. For And he took, for example, Maria in the Cadena case, who was trafficked into a migrant labor camp when she was 12 years old, was was rape, uh, raped upwards of 15 times per day, um, held in a 4 by 8 foot cell in a trailer, and, um, and now can't speak for herself because she's dead, she died of AIDS. How do I explain there's equivalent victimization there? The answer is I don't. You noticed something about the Dutch police policy, right, regarding prostitution? Oh yeah. Well, this this I thought was interesting. It's not a very. Uh, I was interviewing the um, uh, the very erudite uh, head of the the Vice uh, program here, Harold van Helder, um, and I, I at one point I asked him whether the um, Dutch police who were on the Vice squad were forbidden from from paying for sex in their in their um, when they were off duty, and he said no, and I. That struck me as being, you know, potentially compromising, but I'm not Dutch. <laughs> well, but aren't you leaving out the bit where they weren't allowed to go in their own uh, jurisdiction? Ah, um, so it was neatly arranged. That, right? That's true. That's true. They, as long as they don't go to their own jurisdiction. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. But, uh, you know, the Netherlands is a small place, so yeah, but we and ar- people move around. <laughs> yeah, but we arrange everything. Um, so you, you write somewhere that in the beginning, uh, when you started out, you definitely wanted to stay a journalist, mm. not become an activist. Yeah. How naive was that? <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't think of it as naive. I, I, um, I based that largely on my admiration for the work of, of my colleagues, um, my former colleague at the Carr Center at Harvard, uh, Samantha Power, had written a book called A Problem from Hell, which uh, if any of you are, like me, fascinated by mass atrocities, <laughs> you, should, you should pick it up. Um, it's a book on genocide. Um, and she had written this book with a great degree of sympathy for the, for the victims, a great degree of anger um, against uh, uh, the inaction of the international community and particularly the United States with regards to genocide. But she'd also written it with a certain amount of detachment um, and removal, partly because she was writing about things in the past, largely because she was writing about things in the past, but also because the victims that she was writing about were largely dead. And I realized, and you could take any one of these moments, but um, uh, take take a moment in Sudan where I'm talking to somebody who's, who's escaped slavery himself, has walked back to the South, um, you know, one of the earliest moments, or take take the moment in in um in South Africa more m- most recently with this this 15 year old girl who's who's asking me for help and whose best friend I've I've seen on her deathbed um the difference between the victims that Samantha was writing about and the victims that I'm writing about are the victims she was writing about are dead and the victims that I'm writing about are very much still alive and as far as I know some of them are still in hell um well, I said in the beginning, I meant that I really had to put your book down uh, every now and then. I mean, things like the 
beating w one of the beatings of Bill uh, in Haiti, mm -hmm. um, uh, the scene where Ganu's son is beaten in front of his eyes, and there's really nothing oh, you can yeah. do about it, especially, I think, for anyone who has uh, children, children. is uh, um, hard to stomach. Um, you've been studying this subject now for a number of years. Uh, how has that changed you? Um, it's it's it done nothing but increase my resolve to fight the crime. Um, and um, I, I think any time you're confronted with these situations, you sort of have three choices. You can either um, try to erase the images and the, the stories from your memory, um, and sometimes you can live in denial like that, and then um, you can remember it and curl up in a ball yeah. and cry yourself to sleep every but, night. Well, with, <laughs> with, but with all due respect, your resolve is uh, pretty evident. Um, uh, but doesn't it also... I mean, you know, are, are the mm. gray hairs, is that genes? Or <laughs> that? <laughs> That's, a lot of that, uh, yeah, a lot of that came in <laughs> as a result of the... the um, the, but you know, it's it's uh, also long hours writing the book and trying to construct the narrative. As you know, as a as a journalist, it, it takes. Uh, um, I write about Dutch politics, which is a feast uh, <laughs> compared to what you do. Yeah, and you don't have as many gray hairs as a result. <laughs> um, at the end of your book, any reader would be gagging for some perspective, um, and uh, you have a few pretty optimistic sentences in there. You even claim that we can eliminate slavery within a generation, which mm. is where I lit up. Um, but then there's a few minor details that we have to arrange, like broker peace in Sudan, um, arrange for any child in India to have clean drinking water. Mm. Um, minor details. Uh, yeah. Where do you get your optimism from? <laughs> um, it's, it's partly... Because we, even if you look at the most grim aspect of this, which is the number that there are more slaves today than at any point in human history, taken as a percentage of humanity, there are fewer today than ever before. And what that says to me is that the first three abolitionist movements, um, which cost so much in blood and treasure on the part of the United States, on the part of England, on the part of the Western powers, um, those those meant something. They did something. Um, they they made it, as I said at the beginning, axiomatic that that slavery is an abomination. That it is the the duty of men and nations to abolish it. Um, all that we need is to to fund the fight, to to join the fight. And if you take a look at how much it would cost to do this right. Um, it's, it's, it's a relatively inexpensive proposition, relatively. Um, the uh, uh, group that I work with and that I've been uh, actively animating for, and I'm giving a portion of the American edition to, uh, um, to uh, fund this group, uh, the sales of the American edition to fund this group, and actually to date, not from sales of the book, but to date we've, um, I've raised about uh, 1.5 million for this group, which is very exciting. This is a group that um, called Free the Slaves, which is the American wing of Anti-Slavery International, and uh, which is the oldest human rights organization, originally the Anti-Slavery Society, founded by Wilberforce and Clarkson. Um, and they partner with, with local groups around the globe that are already doing abolitionist work. And they, and they use whatever means are appropriate in a given context. Um, so, for example, in, in India, they do a lot of community organization and legal representation to, make, to, to, to bind the quarry workers, for example, together to go and demand their rights in front of a district magistrate and to win the rights to, 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 to work in the field that they've been working in um, their entire lives, but to keep the products of their labor. Um, and what they've found is that by leveraging the market, um, by outbidding uh, other contractors who are using slave labor, and they can do that, um, they, they earn a little bit of money. And, um, and then in other contexts, in the case of 
uh, children in slavery and uh, in the fisheries around Lake Volta, Free the Slaves Partners will actually rescue those children, um, rehabilitate them, give them uh, a basic primary education, which in many cases, in most cases, they never would have had, um, and then give them some access to a livelihood so that they can support them for their families. And the average cost of these programs, uh, top to bottom, across, across the globe, is it costs about $400 to free and to rehabilitate a slave. You multiply that out by the high-end estimate of slaves in the world today, 27 million, and we're talking about roughly uh, 10 to $11 billion, which sounds like a lot of money until you consider that that's what the United States was spending every month in Iraq, and that's what Americans spend every, uh, every year on Valentine's Day. Um, um, and, um, it, it, you know, again, it takes political will more than anything. And in the United States, we, we spend, there, there is a very um, clear mandate on the part, uh, given by the U.S. Congress to the president, to the administration, to monitor and combat slavery. And yet, the amount of money that the American government spends to fight the traffic in human beings on an annual basis is the amount is the same as we we spend to fight the traffic in illegal drugs on a daily basis. Maybe and, then just and and by the way, that's not to diminish the relative horrors of smoking pot, <laughs> but it is to say yeah. which is the more monstrous uh, crime. Maybe because then we really uh, want to give the floor to mm. people in the audience. But maybe on that one last question: How does the do you have any feeling yet of how the Obama administration is, is comparing to the former administrations? I mean, in your book described that, don't go into that mm -hmm. now, but for all sorts of reasons, uh, uh, neoconservatism and, and even influence of evangelicals wasn't so bad for uh, uh, combating the, the slave trade. Um, well, it, it was and it wasn't. I mean, it, it meant a fervent focus on slavery of one type. Exactly. And that yeah. was sex trafficking. Sex, and yeah. as, I, as I mentioned at the outset, that's in terms of the the best numbers that we have. That is less than ten percent of yeah. the total picture of slavery in the world today. Yeah. That's according you to know, the you, you describe it in, as a sort of a better than nothing uh, um, manner. To, to its how's the current administration? To doing? its credit, the current administration has broadened the scope. Um, uh, they're doing they're doing a couple of things which I really like. Um, in the discussion, they're talking first and foremost when they talk about slavery, not about sex trafficking, but about other forms of slavery, and then bringing in sex trafficking as part of the discussion. Um, but fundamentally, uh, I heard some. I heard the the, the current appointee, the current anti-slavery czar, as I've dubbed him in the in the State Department, um, uh, say something I thought. Uh, very profound. He wants to eradicate the term trafficking from the discourse because he says it's confusing, instead referring to slavery because that's the underlying crime. And, um, and I think that, that is, that's a good, that's a good movement. Uh, that's, that, that's, you know, that's a positive development. At the end of the day, however, it's not who in Washington is against slavery. It's how high up in their inbox it is. And, you know, if we're spending as much to fight the, the traffic in human beings in a year as we're spending in a day to fight the, tra you know, people smoking pot, then we've got we've to adjust our priorities. Um, I'm, I'm going to see who has any questions or remarks. The microphone's in the middle now, but we'll actually provide you with the service, I think, of someone um, coming up to you with it. Toch, um, Martin? Yeah. So just raise your hand if you if you have a question. You're up. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's the guy with the mic. Oh, oh he's the guy with the mic. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and if you could please stand up and quickly say who you are. Just this past week, there's a Dutch magazine for women that came out with a. So, sorry, who? Uh, your name, sir? Oh, Tim Killiam. Uh, there's a magazine for women that just came out this past week, and they have a campaign to offer new subscribers a gigolo. Do you know about that yet? I hadn't heard about it, but it's a very... <laughs> <laughs> it's hot news. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's interesting. You, I happen to be having a conversation with a colleague of mine at the Denver University who runs a human trafficking clinic out there. And one of the studies they're doing is on what has been dubbed romance tourism on the part of um, adult American women going um, to the Caribbean, particularly to Jamaica, and paying for 
um, you know, a romantic weekend, which of course includes sex with, uh, with men down there. And, and, you know, the fact that we use the term romance tourism as opposed to sex tourism for, for that is curious. I don't, I, I, now, I, again, um, it's also a little bit beyond my area of expertise. My focus, my focus is trafficking and my focus is slavery. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, consensual adult prostitution, I've, I've talked to lots of prostitutes. I've talked to lots of women working in prostitution in the red light district who are doing so of their own free will. Um, it doesn't, however, mean that I, I, have, a, I have a very broad knowledge of, of, uh, of their reality and of that industry. Hi, Anya Canavan, U.S. Embassy. Um, I think one of we've, your book talks a lot about trafficking uh, all over the world and uh, focuses on. Uh, Could you speak in, into the mic a little bit more? Oh, sorry, prostitution trafficking in I think the developed world. But what about um, to sect or a sector that's uh, highly vulnerable, both in the United States and the Netherlands, which is the agricultural worker sector. We have a huge illegal population in the United States, and here you have uh, some of that, but also a lot of just migrant workers. So I was wondering if you'd done any research on that. I, I, yes. Um, you know, it's a... Uh, I'm surprised. I, did, I don't think I ever said the word agriculture in my talk today because it, you're, you're right. It is a it is a, a, a field and industry where there is a tremendous amount of trafficking um, in almost any country. Uh, in in India, it's largely internal. In the United States, it's um, it's trafficking of of uh, workers from abroad. Actually, um, the next story that I'm going to write uh, is. Um, on uh, or one of the next stories, it may, it may not be the, ne the next story, but, but one of the two next stories is going to be on um, trafficking of Peruvian and Nepalese shepherds into Colorado. Um, they come in on H-2A visas, they come in legitimately, um, but then they are put in these extremely isolated situations. They're not paid, they're told they have a debt, their um, documents are confiscated. Um, occasionally there are beatings and um, and this is happening on U.S. soil, and they're producing products. They're you know producing wool um, that is sold in uh, the United States with a made in USA label. Um, and uh, it's one more example um, of how we really need to ask about ask corporations about the supply chains of the, the, the products that they're, that they're selling to us. Because many times products cost more than they seem, cost more than the price tag. And actually I have an have a illustration of a corporation apparently that's doing it right, although I don't <laughs> want to endorse it too much. But an, uh, a, a reporter yesterday gave me this um, Tony's um, Choco Lonely, which is also delicious. Um, um, but it, it has a little uh, uh, a chain breaking stamp up, up here, and um, and it's uh, it's it's guaranteed slavery free chocolate, um, which is a very good idea. And and I think as as consumers, we should reward those companies that do the right thing and and um, uh, purchase uh, uh, base basic commodities and and products that that are produced. Um, free of slave labor, um, and we should uh, we should hold responsible those companies that don't. And ultimately, I believe the market will reward transparency. Is, is that the only product you have in your? Yeah, I, 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 and, and unfortunately, I don't know where this shirt was made. And as far as I know, it could have been you know child slaves in Uzbekistan that harvested the cotton. And I think it you know I, it's a. Uh, uh, my next big push is on is on supply chain slavery. It's a very complicated problem, but it's a it's a way that all of us um, may be unknowingly complicit in in the problem of slavery. Um, my name is Stefan de Gaal. I'm a fir first year student here in Amsterdam. Um, what I got from your story is that it's mainly um, the classical story about role division between men owning women. And to what extent do you think um, the inequality between men and women in many countries is holding back the emancipation of slaves? Did you get it? I, 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 sorry. I think, sorry, but for us up here it's really hard to hear. I think you said, how does the inequality between men and women, men and women holds back the, yep, the holds back the emancipation of slaves? 
um, in other words, how do gender relations play into, um, you know, there's no question that disproportionately slaves in the world are women and girls. Um, and uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Nick Kristoff, who's a columnist for the New York Times, has written a book called Half the Sky, um, in which she leads with a very uh, compelling uh, statistic. Um, uh, uh, and I've spoken on stage with him several times, and he always leads with this question. I, I'll, I'll try it on you guys. How many, by show of hands, how many of you think that there are uh, more women in the world than men? Uh, so most of you think that there are more women in the world. Actually, there are more men in the world than women. Um, and uh, that's because of the, uh, the, the early deaths, the, the infant mortality, um, and also because of uh, infanticide and the, uh, um, directed at, at, uh, at female children and, and, and targeted um, uh, abortions once, once the, 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 um, the gender of a, of a fetus is determined in utero. Um, uh, there are, uh, I, I can't remember Nick's statistics exactly, but there are a very large number of missing women in the world as a result of of uh, a very intrinsic, uh, uh, intrinsic to many societies, um, uh, sexism and and um, uh, devaluation of women as human beings, um, and any time that's the that's the status um, of women, they are going to be the first ones in a family um, who are or who are trafficked, who are who are given away. Um, uh, the 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 boys will be the first ones to receive education. Um, and so I think it absolutely factors in. Um, at the same time, my approach to this is a little bit different from from Nick's. We overlap on a lot of on a lot of what we call for, but I don't think that the end of um, slavery can wait for the end of gender discrimination. Um, I think that I think that there is a uh, abs- obviously we have to push for greater rights for, for, for women in societies and for girls in societies, but at the same time, that can't stop us from viewing this for what it is, which is a crime, um, and, uh, and a crime that requires uh, both a, uh, a comprehensive push uh, to prevent the crime from happening, which certainly includes amelioration of these gender inequalities, um, but also a real prosecution of the perpetrators. I was struck by how all these different value systems in different regions are used to legitimize slavery. Uh-huh. You know, in, in Sudan, uh, Islam is used. You mm. just described in South Africa, voodoo uh, plays into uh-huh. it. Uh, in India, I guess, the whole caste system is sort of... Uh, uh, like It seems like slave traders and slave keepers always find something to legitimize what they're, what they're doing. Well, and, you know, we have somebody here in the audience, um, Pastor Tom Marfo. Um, who works in Balmer, um, who, who can talk a little bit more about so, some of the um, traditional practices which are, are used to, to um, shore up the, um, uh, the enslavement of, uh, of individuals. I interviewed Pastor Tom uh, uh, for the book. I, 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 I wound up um, uh, t- talking to one of the, the women who he helped uh, get out uh, of slavery. And... Um, uh, maybe if if you could say just a couple of words, I'd be I, I'd, I'm sure everybody would be very curious to hear what's going on in Amsterdam in in your community. Wait, wait one second for the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ben. Um, it's very interesting listening to all that has been said here concerning various uh, cultural factors that uh, you know are used as instruments and tools to enslave. I mean, people would use anything they can to, whether, you know, emotional chains or whatever. Uh, Talking about the continent of Africa particularly, and um, most especially uh, the area of West Africa, what happens is that uh, almost all the girls that are brought to Europe, uh, and of course Europe is the, the hub of our trafficking center, uh, it's just a few hours across, uh, either by land or by, by air. And um, the girls are, first of all, taken to the shrine um, and uh, 
body parts are taken from them, the hair, uh, blood from the, the, when they are in their period, blood is taken. And a lot of the girls you see here in your city, a lot of the African girls particularly, you find some, some three marks on the, on the joints and the breast side. And all this blood is used to conjure voodoo rituals against them. Now, it's so difficult to explain what uh, spiritism is to a scientific Western mind that want everything to be tested in a laboratory uh, without which they don't believe it. Uh, but for me, growing up in a voodoo cultural background, I understand precisely what it is when it is used against a teenager. And uh, some of the girls are taken not only to the shrine, but sometimes to, uh, you know, the cemetery in the middle of the night to swear to the gods, to the, to the spirits, that you're going to obey your madam, you're never going to mention your name, you're never going to go to the police, you're never going to betray your madam. If you do this and that and that will happen to you. And uh, anybody, whether an adult or a teenager, who had been initiated into voodooism has no chance, would never ever break the vows because they know that they're going to die. They feel they're going to die. And they've seen the power of voodoo demonstrated uh, in their cultural setting as children growing up to adulthood. So these are some of the things that are used. I have written a paper on that, uh, which I help give to the government. I work for the government as a consultant on this issue dealing with the voodoo that has been used on the West African girls brought to this country. So if you want some copies on that, I can make it available. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think we in the, we in the sort of um, secular or vaguely secular I guess you can't really call America secular, but um, uh, uh, in the vaguely secular West, we, when we hear stories of voodoo, uh, you it instantly conjures up these ideas um, that we consider so far-fetched um, and so far from, you know, so connected with superstition that we sort of roll our eyes. Uh, as I've seen, if you grow up in a place like northern Nigeria or you grow up in Ghana or, you, or, or, um, or even if you grow up in, in, in parts of South Africa where voodoo wasn't practiced but, but uh, sangomas are, are, are considered um, uh, the, the primary healers, um, there is a great deal of, of trust attached to, um, to those voodoo priests and to those, those sangomas. And um, there's a great deal of power attached to them as well. And so it is, it is one more method. Um, uh, and I, as I saw in, in South Africa, these Nigerian uh, traffickers, they would use voodoo along with violence, along with guns, um, as, as a way of completely controlling the women that they had purchased from the recruiters. Do you think the World the Cup, in, do you think World Cup should somehow or could somehow be used to address this topic? Oh, sure. If, if, um, if Sepp Blatter gave a damn. <laughs> um, I, I honestly don't think he does. I, I, uh, Sepp Blatter, the head of FIFA, is somebody who, um, uh, who, when Cristiano Ronaldo um, was trying to get out of his contract at Manchester United uh, to play for Real Madrid, Cristiano Ronaldo, who's then being paid $24,000 per week, to, to, uh, to play soccer. Um, Cristiano Ronaldo said, oh, they won't let me out of my contract. I'm a modern-day slave. He actually used that term. Mm -hmm. And Sepp Blatter said, yes, this, this young man is a modern-day modern slave. This is modern-day slavery. And Sepp Blatter, when he was made aware of the, the phenomena of trafficking around the World Cup stadiums, his response was to defund the child trafficking program, that, uh, the anti-child trafficking program that the World Cup had, had, um, had begun funding. Uh, and, you know, I think, that, I think that that is a foul move. Yeah. But, of course, there's a lot of players going there who could each in their own responsibility, I guess. Of know. course, of course. And, and I, you know, I think, um, I think that the players are ultimately who hold the power. Um, and I think that they could do a lot if they, um, if they chose to. Yeah. Does someone want the final question? Hello, my name is uh, Oriana Geretsa.
Um, why didn't you um, interview the men who raped these women or children? So, sorry, I, I missed the verb. Yeah, we're in the, it's not we're in the involved, um, yeah. Why didn't you interview the men who raped uh, the women and children? Um, I, I tried. I, I, I went into sex clubs and brothels, <laughs> and I tried to talk to, to men. And um, this was actually I was here during the last World Cup. I was this is when I was doing the the research, um, and you know I always began talking about how the Dutch team was doing and you know how, uh, and then as soon as I said so, you know what about these what about what do you think about these women? Nothing, you know. I mean these are not this is they, they, these are as I said, it may be legal but it's not legitimate, um, and a lot of the men are ashamed of the fact that they are visiting prostitutes. Um, uh, which, you know, gives lie to the whole idea that this is just like any other profession, that this is just like any other uh, harmless recreational activity. Um, and, um, uh, but one way that I, I attempted to get into their heads was I went to these online forums. Uh, and you can go to, for example, hookers.nl, which is uh, the, the, the Dutch equivalent of this, but there's also... Um, uh, the one that I really was interested in was called the International Sex Guide. Um, uh, and the International Sex Guide is an online forum for, you know, if you, if you happen to find yourself in Mauritania and you want to find a, a, a prostitute, somebody to pay for sex, then you go to the International Sex Guide and lo and behold, there's an entry on Mauritania or Papua New Guinea or Palau, or Togo. Um, yeah. and, um, and there you see some very interesting discussions and you see in that anonymous forum, you see men bringing forward, and it's not scientific, mind you, because it's anonymous, um, but you see um, over the course of several years, you can track men by their handles and you can, you can see the progress of their attitudes. And their basic attitude, um, there were several basic attitudes that emerged. One was um, uh, best to not consider the, these women's realities when they're not, um, when they're not with you. Um, uh, best to go into out of sight, out of mind mode with these girls because um, there was a, a definite recognition that particularly, you know, if you're talking about an Uzbek uh, girl working in prostitution in uh, Dubai, that girl probably has debts and probably is being beaten and being coerced. They, they recognize that. Um, but the, the other aspect that I found fascinating and very revealing was these men read the back of The Economist, the, the emerging market indicators uh, in the back of The Emo Economist, like the sports pages. And, um, and, and they decide and they, they were drawn to countries that were in real economic crisis. And so, you know, uh, when the Belarusian... Uh, when, when the Romanian economy started to, to stabilize and the Moldovan economy started to stabilize, then they went to Belarus, um, where the women were, were poorer and more desperate. And one of them put it very explicitly. He said, um, you know, what, what is it that all of the women, all the countries with the really good women have in common? Have in common? Poverty. That's right. I said it. Poverty. Um, because poverty is what keeps these women from getting uppity and demanding um, like they are in the Western world. Um, I just thought you might be interested to know, uh, you mentioned briefly in your book an, uh, a certain Amsterdam alderman or guy from the city council who also went to the Tippel oh, yeah. Zone at the Thamesweg. Um, he's now standing for mayor, I think. Right? Oh, you know already, yeah. <laughs> he, he resigned in 2004, and uh, he's now publicly eyeing the, uh, the mayor's office. And I don't know if it's total coincidence that his Social Democrat Party has now put forward a formidable candidate um, uh, to run uh, himself. Um, is this going to be your life from now on, this topic? Um, I thought you meant... Uh, no, sorry, sorry, no, no, I no. I thought no. you meant... Prostitution, but um, no, no, slavery. Is uh, that, I mean, are you, are you, could you ever let it go, or is this going to be your life? I, I think I'll always do some work on this. Um, I think the next, um, my next book will be on snowboarding, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. It's actually uh, much more entertaining than I thought. Um.
And, and what I mean is that uh, Ben did, as in the book, he did a very nice job of humanizing something that's, that's inhuman. Thank you very much, Ben, for being here and for braving the, uh, the volcanic ash. Uh, Kustau, a wonderful job. Thank you. I would also like to thank a few of our sponsors, the Holland America Friendship Foundation, Aegon, our corporate friends, our members, Kose Publishers for bringing Ben here. And I'd particularly like to thank the U.S. Embassy, not only for support, giving us regular support, but for giving us uh, uh, special funding to, so that we could um, make this evening happen. And uh, I just wanted to um, note that next, uh, our next event, April 28th, is with John Krakauer. Uh, that's on Wednesday. And uh, thank you all very much for being here. Ben will uh, sign books right up here.